to that you're all here today. Welcome. And we're also delighted to have for our speaker today, as part of our International Studies Public Forum, Neo Mayanga, who is a, an artist from South Africa. Uh, Neo was born in Soweto, which has changed quite a lot over the years, but has, uh, especially during the time of the revolution in South Africa, was a hotbed of activity. And uh, Neo is going to uh, present anecdotes and medleys of songs that challenge, that demonstrate how public transcripts uh, are challenged through performance, um, through artistry. Neo is, uh, as I said, he's an artist. He's both a composer and a performer. He performs all over the world. And he's also an affiliate of uh, the University of Bader Grand's Institute for Social and Economic Research called WISER. And we're fortunate here at UCI that the uh, UC Humanities Research Institute, headed by David Theo Goldberg, who is here, we want to thank you for co-sponsoring Neo, for bringing him here, because Neo is here in residence. Uh, for several weeks as part of an arrangement with Weiser in Johannesburg. As we know, South Africa has been not only the site of a major, major uh, transformation from an apartheid government to a post-apartheid government, but continues to be a site for many, many kinds of social protests. Um, currently, uh, both minors, protests, student protests, as we heard about last week. And so we're delighted uh, to have Neil with us. In addition to his own work, he trained in, or in addition to his current work and his talk today, a little bit more background, he trained in the Italian magical tradition. He co-founded an acoustic pop duo, Black Sunshine. He has uh, been writing operas, operettas, He's produced a number of albums, and uh, he co-founded the Pan-African Space Station in 2008 uh, to be a continually evolving host of cutting-edge Pan-African music and sound art on the internet. And so we are very, very fortunate to have him with us today. Please join me in welcoming Neil Mugenda. Thank you very much for coming. Can you hear me? Can I speak from here? Yeah. OK. I, I'm very glad you've come. Uh, in the communication about preparing for this evening, I, I sent through a few ideas just as a suggestion of what we could all share to talk about protest music. What I'll do today is just give you a few examples of the kinds of music and the kind of aesthetic that has influenced how I've created the work that I've created. Um, South Africa, as Cecilia mentions, is very well known for being a country that protests all the time and protests through music in particular. And so I'm going to play you examples of those things. And I won't necessarily play full pieces or full compositions today. I'll go in and out and play medleys and I'll stop start and either explain during the playing sequence or I'll stop and explain and then play further, okay? And if there are any questions at any point, uh, we can we can cut into the record and continue.
the two examples I played were a combination of work that has been inspired by our tradition of, song, of war making uh, and war song called Nglamu in the Zulu tradition and in the Ngunin tradition. The, the, the stamp of the feet usually goes with the carrying of um, what we used to call traditional weapons, uh, the spear, the knopkiri, um, and these were all tools that were used at a certain point by very young people to stand up against a military state, uh, to stand up against bombs and tear gas and water cannons and police dogs. And so this tradition has, has really become about joy in the most paradoxical way. Because often what happens is thousands and thousands of people gather on the streets, block off all kinds of exits and entrances, and perform this style. And because we've all imbibed it somehow uh, from our mothers, uh, suckling at the breast, no one actually ever remembers learning a protest song. Uh, we've all grown up in a kind of tradition that has made it available and uh, equally possible for all. I saw a YouTube clip the other day of a young black man trying to teach a young white man how to toy toy. And the, and the tagline was, uh, in the new South Africa, everything is for everyone, black and white. <laughs> and it was a, a wonderful reflection about how things have changed and how things have traveled. Uh, because of course, the stamping of, of that kind of uh, noise making on the floor is associated with a certain color, with a certain class in the country. So the one tradition is very much war song, war making. The second tradition is to do, of course, with the church, with uh, the history of colonialism, which starts with the Dutch that come in in the middle of the 1600s. And between that, the, the, the Portuguese colonists and the French Huguenots. And then uh, as we enter the 19th century, a very strong presence of the British colonialists. And it's from that church tradition and from that Christian uh, uh, establishment that we gain the four-part harmony singing uh, protest tradition in South Africa, which I'll play examples of now. So that's a, an example of a church song, 
that was composed at the end of the 1800s by um, a composer called Enoch Sontonga. And he was a, 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 a preacher, he was a religious man, uh, he came from a rural community but was also an urbanized black individual. Um, we couldn't quite call him middle class at that point because middle class wasn't available even though people were educated to a certain degree. Uh, there were certain um, conversations around the middle class, the possibilities around the middle class that were just simply not available. And that song becomes adopted by uh, the African National Congress, which is the ruling party, to become the, the theme, the anthem of the movement, the liberation movement. And so you'll hear a lot of the material that I've got in the archive happens to come out of um, ANC archives, but these are not actually ANC songs. These are songs that were shared by uh, the liberation movement across the board. So today when people protest and they sing some of these songs, one of the paradoxes of the present day is people from different uh, warring factions will sing the same protest songs because they are uh, a shared legacy of all South Africans. This song becomes adopted in the 1920s by the African National Congress, but then as the liberation movement gains uh, strength in Africa, across the continent in, in the 50s, late 50s and 60s, the newly liberated uh, democracies of the African states start, some members start to adopt this and write new lyrics to it. So you find this song sung in Kenya, for example, the people in Tanzania who sang it, the people in Uganda who sing it, the people in Zimbabwe who sang it, also different versions. Essentially, it's a prayer to God to bless Africa and to keep its people and its children safe. Um, the very uh, big controversy surrounding this present uh, incarnation of the anthem at the moment is where I've stopped it is right where it transitions into a an edited uh, mix, an edited uh, slit edit with the, the erstwhile Africana anthem from the National Party government. Uh, and that's caused a lot of consternation in, in certain, uh, in certain uh, quarters, certainly, about the mixing of these traditions. Even though the Afrikaans version has now got a more, more healthy, let's say, lyrical content, a, a more progressive and a, and a much friendlier content. It still causes a lot of ire in, in a lot of quarters. Um, so I find this an incredible metaphor for the place that South Africa finds itself today because we, we still protest very much in the same way that we've been doing for the last, say, 60 years. Except what's happening now is the struggles are a lot more confusing because the big ogre, the big evil of apartheid is gone. And so what people protest about now, I think people in this room would understand. So very recently we've had huge protests that have taken over the whole country about fees and the fee structure at university, which cuts out a certain number of people, uh, usually the poor, usually the working class. And students rose up finally and refused to pay a, um, an increment that was planned to be for 10% for next year. And in winning that battle uh, and getting the president to agree to a 0% increase, uh, it's now come to the fore that there are all kinds of other issues to do with uh, access to uh, resources at university. But actually, there's a whole slew of other conversations that are happening in the social fabric. So protest becomes a very important technology for us. And the prayer or the prayerful nature of it it really has informed many of us who, when I started singing certain songs, like the one I'll play you now, I had no clue that it was used as a protest song. It was a hymn, it was a church hymn. Even though I never went to church, all of us used to learn these songs. And the lyrics here simply go, everything has been made by you. So let's 
exiled because he played in a band, a mixed color band, at a time when that was illegal in South Africa. And the band escaped and went to live in exile in the UK. And Mongezi eventually died in a mental asylum. And he claimed in his diaries to have died from sadness at losing his home. So often we write songs to celebrate people and to, in a round, dedicate our bodies and our strength. And usually uh, the deaths of the people who are involved in those protests uh, become uh, a, a a moment to write about, a moment to celebrate. I won't be able to play you 
a clip here, but when I, in preparation to coming here, sent through uh, some proposals. One of the things I suggested people watch or might want to watch was a film by Rihat Desai called Minor Shot Down. I don't know if any of you have seen that. And there's a scene in that film which is really about a big strike, one of the biggest strikes South Africa has seen in the last decade by um, mine workers, people who go underground to dig for gold. Um, and they were, they were struggling for a particular rate to earn. Uh, and it was being refused them by the corporate interests. And the argument in certain quarters goes that some of the mine owners, uh, companies like Lonmin, have within them members of the elites, of the ruling elites, so people within the African National Congress who negotiated with the police to stop uh, the protest. Not only that, but to essentially shoot and control the violence. What happened was a huge massacre. Over 100 people were shot by black policemen, um, and about 34 people died. And in, in that struggle, uh, one man stood out. Lots of people call him the man with the green blanket. His name is Mambush. And he was one of the spokespeople, one of the spokespersons for the strikers. And, and so when I speak about death, that literally happened to him during this uh, scuffle with the police in 2012. And out of that, a song was written. So, and these songs are often performed a cappella, so I'm gonna find a way of placing it on the keyboard to play it for you. And it's written very much in a style that is hybridizing the war song, which is made up of what we call bitonality, these two chords, or these two, for the music students here, these two adjacent tones that are the centers of the melodic structure. So for example, we'd have Our war music works with this bitonality, stepping on the one foot and stepping on the other. And the church tradition has the, what we call in, probably your music class is diatonic, right? So it, the scale of do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, yeah, which, some people think it's a Western scale. It's not, it's a, it's a human scale. <laughs> it, it evolves because of how the human ear works. It's, a, it's a, biologic, a biological fact of life. So, Mambushi's song is. Sorry, I can't project the lyrics for you. It's essentially the song is saying uh, they are shaking in their boots, these soldiers who are standing before us with guns. They're shaking in their boots, the soldiers or the police who killed Mambush. And the second verse is how, how do they expect us to feel grace and forgive? now that they are in front of us shaking in their boots. And people sing these songs while smiling, and that doesn't necessarily mean nothing bad is going to happen. So if you watch that film again, 
There's a scene where they're sitting on the ground, negotiating with the policemen to let them pass, to go to a hilltop where the workers were gathering to share the day's news and to strategize. And on this particular day, the police had been told to cut them off and to stop them and to disarm them, disarming them of their spears and their kiris and their stones. And the workers refused and they said, these are not for fighting, these are not for attacking anyone. These are just the tools we carry with us when we sing. And uh, the police wouldn't let them through. And so the men, there's a particular scene where the men rise up slowly and they sing one of these uh, war songs. But they sing them very quietly uh, with hunched shoulders. And somehow that allows them, the act of singing allows them to stand up and start moving, even though the police were, 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 were refusing them the tarafe. And, and I think that that example of how music has been used in South African protest to help create a solidarity, but to also create a defensive net uh, around people and their, you know, their, their, their comfort zone against the, the bullets and against the, the dogs really tells us something about what the place of protest can be today. <coughs> And it's interesting speaking about protest in this country because, of course, there's a, a very strong connection with the civil rights movement here. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of Mire Makeba. I mentioned to someone, but I think they were too young to have heard that music. So I'm going to play you some, some of the archive of Mire Makeba as an illustration. So that, that song, that recording comes out of a, a, a record called An Evening with Belafonte and Makeba, which came out in, I think, 1965, 64, 65. And so that's the link for me and for people of my generation with the civil rights movement in this country because Miriam Makeba left South Africa as a, a member of the cast in a musical called King Kong which was billed as the first jazz opera uh, that had black stars and um, white choreographers and uh, producers. And it was illegal, of course, because it was illegal for black and white people to work together in close proximity. It was even more illegal for black people to perform in a mixed uh, ensemble with white people on stage in a whites-only uh, theater. So what would happen with um, plays like King Kong or musicals like King Kong is they'd perform and the only, say, the black musicians, if it was a black story, would be in front of the curtain. And there'd be a curtain very much like this. And behind the curtain, white musicians would be playing along with them. Um, just so that, even though people in the audience knew that was the case, it was just to, to you know, keep up pretenses. And while they were in this production, many of the performers were considered uh, not political at all. They were not particularly activists in their bent. And it was through King Kong getting invited to perform in London 
1959, uh, that a lot of the cast went over, and as they went over, they went over on what was called an exit permit. They couldn't get a passport at the time because the government didn't trust that they would represent the country in the best possible way. So they got an exit permit, and that meant they were never allowed to come back. And essentially, they went into exile. And so people like Mirren Makeba, people like Hugh Masekela, from having gone to London, then were invited to perform in uh, New York City. So people start to enter this country as artists, but they start to discover um, the civil rights movement and how that conversation correlates with the conversation in South Africa. So people like Harry Belafonte were very, very instrumental in getting a lot of young black South Africans through school, invited to America, <coughs> and invited to essentially also recreate themselves anew in exile, but they became artists, they became academics. Um, so there's a, a huge relationship between these two countries. And certainly with uh, protest songs like We Will Overcome, I imagine our version of that would be something like uh, what we call Senzenina, which is a song really that asks, it's a lament, it's a song that asks, what have we done? What have we as black people done? So songs like that we grew up hearing and singing and it's not when you, lick, when you listen to the lyrical content, it's, it's not obviously a political song. Um, the, one, the previous one that I played uh, where Mirren Makeba is singing with uh, the Belafonte crew is quite political. Uh, it's Nancy uh, Dotem Nyama Fervurt, which is warning the Prime Minister of the time, Fervurt, here comes the black man. There was something called Swat Khafar, the fear of the black man. And that song is quite special because it was written, we know, by uh, Vuisi Lemini. And I say special because we make protest songs, but generally don't ever attribute a writer or a composer to the songs. So Vuisi Lemini's songs are some of the few that have a known uh, creative director, let's say. He was um, chosen by the ANC in exile to become the it's kind of the protest composer par excellence, because he, he had a wonderful bass baritone voice and was uh, apparently a very um, wonderful, nurturing and natural leader. And the story about him goes, he was arrested and was sentenced to death, to hang, and on the day of his um, execution, the inmates knew that he was walking to the gallows because they, they heard his voice and he was singing the song all the way until the hanging. So it's become quite a, a, a mythic status uh, gained by this particular song. I'm not sure if I can plug into, can the people who help me with the speakers, can you, does anybody have a jack? I'm not sure if I can plug into that system over there, but I'm wondering if I can plug in here. Because part of the story that I want to tell you... Oh, do you have a cable? I do. I have a small cable. Let's, so. let's try. If I can unplug the keyboard and put this in. I'm trying to do all of this... Um, if you, you need an amplifier for that. Yeah. Oh, you have one of those. Yeah. 
Okay, cool. I think it might work. Oh. So I hope it works because it's. My attempt to complicate your, your perception of these songs, right? So, of what I've played you are. Let's see. My work. Yeah. <laughs> so, what I've played you are, are the two traditions of the church and the war song, the drama song. But what's happened, obviously, and I think it's what's happening in this country too is with, with forced segregation and with domination comes migration, as you're experiencing here, as Europe is experiencing now. And with that comes a lot of exchange at the bottom of the barrel to do with culture mainly. And so even though we've absorbed all of these traditions, we've mixed them with the war traditions in South Africa, there's another tradition that skirts around and it's the traditions of the slaves who were brought to South Africa by the Dutch. So I want to play you, because I know that we're, we're, we're living in, just up, just up the road from Hollywood, not far from the center of the universe. And, and I know people here like to think that they, started before everybody else, but this is a piece that I learned in India that was written apparently 5,000 years ago. <laughs> I obviously don't play it like they played it 5,000 years ago. But it tells me something about how the shared legacies of the migration and the oppression actually result in all kinds of amazing discoveries too. And this is a song that people sing in South Africa and people still sing in India. beginning of the evening as an offering to Lord Ganesha, the remover of obstacles. So I think I'm going to stop there, having illustrated, I think, the war song, the church song, and the confusing song from slaves of everywhere, the melting pot. Right? And I wonder, I mean, I'm quite interested in, in finding out while I'm here, I'm going to be here for a month, as Cecilia said what you're feeling around the state of affairs is here to do with protest and protest music, because of course there's a very famous tradition here, 
Yours tends to be quite individualistic, actually. So your protest uh, writers are folk songwriters. So I know Bob Dylan is a big one. John Baez, who I met once many years ago and toured with. And I, for us, it's a group effort. And anybody can sing, anybody can join, anybody can perform. And, and it's out in the street, and it's without all of this electricity. <laughs> right? So I'd be curious to see what can be done with that tradition. And I'd be interested to hear what you guys as students here do with that.